There we are. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the Q&A with John McIntosh and me. I'm Ann Carey Ford, your hostess and moderator. Uh, I think this is episode uh, 18. Uh, today's topic is, is going to be depression. Oh, boy. <laughs> and, um, you know, this is a series that we've been doing uh, about the great shift. What's really going on? Question mark, question mark, question mark. So if you want to catch up with us, if you haven't seen the broadcasts in the past, you can certainly do so at the link right there um, and watch the previous episodes. Now, if you have questions as we go along today, if you're on live, please look to the right of your screen and you'll see a comment section and I'll, um, I'll pick those up as we go along and hopefully have time to squeeze them into the questions that we that have been sent in by email, which brings me to how you can email John if you have a question, if you're watching a replay, uh, globalpeaceweb at gmail.com. He loves email. <laughs> so make sure you um, send your question in and we'll try to read it on the broadcast if possible. Uh, we'll keep this at 55 minutes as we usually do. And um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, my name is Ann Carey Ford. I'd love to invite you to the website, voiceofdivinefeminine.com, which I popped up earlier this year, um, which shares some insights uh, that I've had about the great shift uh, since, I don't know, a couple of years. So I'd love for you to check that out and reach out to me through that website if you're so inclined. So, I think most of you are very familiar with John, but um, if you're not, I invite you to go to this link to check out some of his books. He's written many books. This is where 15 of them are available. And I don't think he really needs any introduction. I, I'm gonna bring him on now to say a few words before we get into our Q&A. Thank you uh, very much, Anne. And, and again, thank you so much for being the uh, hostess of uh, whatever uh, this is that we're doing, uh, Q&A online uh, related to uh, what's actually really happening and not so much what's really happening in the world, but what's really happening in your uh, conscious or unconscious experience. Um, the, uh, the theme uh, today that felt uh, relevant as a result of the ongoing expansion um, of um, chaos, conflict, confusion uh, that's occurring in the world, uh, dramatic expansion. And, and you could say it's tied to the American election, but it's, it, it's, it's very much around the world. Um, and uh, I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Um, the, uh, the, the idea, the feeling, the presence of depression um, is a very frequent manifestation in many people's lives when conflict and confusion and chaos expands. Now, this can be microcosmically in their own life. The world could be flowing along in, in a, let's say, a phase uh, that doesn't seem to be um, that dramatic. Um, uh, but one's personal life could be going through an enormous amount of trauma. Um, and there are thousands of ways that that can be happening. Um, or, uh, like now, uh, the entire world uh, is on fire, uh, and uh, this can uh, instigate enormous fear in people that may have felt that they were relatively balanced um, uh, until then. They may have spent decades in, in what they felt was a relatively balanced life. Uh, and um, at this moment, um, the world uh, is giving uh, most of humanity many, many opportunities to look at who they're not uh, by showing them the mirror of their conditioning, which is conditioning is, the, is what manifests the false self, who, the body-mind identity, who you're not. Um, and the chaos gives you a dramatic opportunity, you meaning everyone, a dramatic opportunity to see who you are not. So for many, this can uh, dovetail into feelings of hopelessness, uh, helplessness, uh, and depression, suicidal thoughts. 
I can tell you that uh, the vast majority of my life, having grown up in a highly dysfunctional family, which I'm very grateful for, as it led me towards my freedom, um, uh, I had uh, deep depression constantly, over and over again, and uh, often had suicidal thoughts, even after I jumped off the cliff into the unknown, no matter what, um, for at least 10 years of the 15 that it took before I walked across the bridge to my freedom, uh, the way I put it, um, I still had um, hopeless, helpless, uh, depressive, suicidal thoughts. Uh, so this is completely normal. And it's looked at very often, certainly by the mind, um, and most definitely by medicine, psychology, um, um, allopathic uh, drugs and surgery, uh, natural medicine, therapies, uh, it's looked at as something that can be therapized. It can be, if that's a word, therapized, that, uh, that can be massaged uh, out of you. Let's put it that way. Um, but uh, that never happens because conditioning, which brought it about, um, can only be shifted from one form to another form until it dissolves. This is why trying to fix the world, for example, can definitely bring about a manifestation of what appears to be a fix. Uh, but the conditioning, if it hasn't been dissolved, that is um, destroyed, burned up, will appear somewhere else. So microcosmically in an individual life, if a person is depressed and they take a drug, let's say, and they feel better. Um, or they, they go to a psychiatrist uh, or psychologist and they feel better. Um, or possibly they've just got good friends that are around them and are always supporting them and they feel better. The underlying condition of conditioning that brought about the depressive, hopeless, helpless feelings is still there. And it will most definitely manifest, if not in the same way, uh, in some other way, which is in resonance with that particular conditioning. Very often, feelings of unworthiness, which is the root of all conditioning, the feeling of I'm not good enough, I don't exist, I'm not important, I'm not worthy of. Uh, and then the offshoots, which is uh, guilt uh, and remorse. Um, these uh, can bring about all kinds of manifestations that you wouldn't call depression. It could be that uh, within, uh, let's say, one's life, uh, you experience many, many failures, what the mind calls failures, where you try something, it doesn't work. Uh, you have relationships, they don't work. You have conflict uh, at work, uh, with friends, uh, in associations that you have. Uh, uh, you're prone to accidents. Uh, things go wrong. Um, this is a natural um, result of conditioning related to unworthiness that doesn't necessarily manifest as depression. Um, but it's the same root cause. And until it is dissolved in the fires of uh, who you are not, some people call Sat saying the fires of who are who you are not, um, until that occurs, it will continue to show up. And these things that continue to show up are blessings because anything that shows you who you are not, that you don't run from or sedate from or distract from, gives you the opportunity to uh, face them. And ideally, through either surrender and or self-inquiry, which I always recommend both, um, will actually dissolve them. And so they're a blessing. They don't feel so good. They may feel terrible but they're an enormous blessing. So let's just look at the concept of, of um, uh, depression uh, from what really is going on. At the deepest level within us, uh, which actually is not within us, the body-mind uh, identity is within us as the self, so it's surrounding us um, and it's not surrounding us in the sense that there is an us. It's surrounding the illusion of a body, mind, identity, or a me, or a person, that illusion. 
But just looking at it from the standpoint of within us, which is a phraseology that's more acceptable to the mind at this moment for most, it is a longing, depression is a longing for home. Home meaning the full conscious awareness of who you are. And there is a, a sorrow, not the same kind of sorrow that's associated with happiness and sorrow, which is present in everyone's life all day, every day in a myriad of different ways, sometimes dramatic, sometimes just simmering, but it's always there. Um, this is a sorrow that is associated with um, a memory. It's very subtle, very often you're not aware of what the memory is at all. It's just a feeling of deep sorrow of missing home. Now, of course, you can never, ever not be home. You're always home. You're just not aware of it. As Rumi said, I, you know, I've knocked on the door and uh, it opens and I realized that I was knocking from the inside, paraphrasing. Uh, this is the way it really is. You're knocking from the inside of home. You are home. You're not in home, at home. You are home. Home is who you are. It's another name for you. So you're never not the self. You're never not God. You're never not consciousness. You're never not one. We, everything that appears to be, is all inside one as the self. You just forgot. Everyone, for a while, forgot. Some have remembered, as I have been blessed, I, I've remembered, and, and it's constant memory. I'm constantly aware of who I am. This doesn't make me different than you or better than you. It just makes me free and uh, in constant joy. So depression then becomes, and I know this is difficult to listen to, your friend. I, I'm not suggesting that you fan the flames of depression. I'm merely saying that if you embrace it as an idea, if you like, or concept or feeling is better, that this is actually like a crumb trail uh, or you tie a string to your finger that has endless uh, string. Uh, and you go into the deep, dark forest of forgetfulness, and that string, if you pull it, brings you back out of the forest into full conscious awareness. So depression is a kind of a crumb trail or a string that you follow out of the forest of forgetfulness. So if it's looked at that way, it may be a little bit more digestible um, because I know for certain that most people on the planet now, especially deep sleepers, but uh, those that are looking, most that are watching this, are looking into the truth to some extent. Perhaps uh, it's their priority. Hopefully it is. Um, but depression or the feelings of depression or hopelessness or helplessness, call it whatever you want, those, those three <coughs> very often seem similar, um, uh, is an enormous blessing. Um, because it is the crumb trail uh, out of the dark forest of forgetfulness. So um, that's what I wanted to say to start this off, and we'll hand it back to uh, Anne to start the questions. Great. I'm going to start with a question by Elaine, who says, I can truly see this whole experience as a dream <clears throat> now. How beautiful to remember who I truly am, the gentle stillness, the self. I am still clearing, but no fear, just noticing the false self and knowing that all is love, being in the now of the unknown. The feeling now is that there is only one. I am not sure where I am as I have let go of all attachments and I'm just being here now. There is nothing to do here. It is truly being present as the self. I have surrendered to the freedom this now offers me and the feeling of being alone has faded away now, and I'm finding it harder to find words to communicate. Please comment. Well, this is uh, absolutely beautiful, obviously. This um, uh, soul, uh, you can call it, uh, I don't refer to individuals as souls because there is no such thing. There's only the self. Uh, it's a term that many people use. Uh, being is a better word. Um, this being, I, I know personally, and I know that she is uh, completely focused uh, totally on, on freedom no matter what and lives uh, every breath um, with that, that focus. So she's what I call uh, free with whispers. 
um, just a tiny amount of, uh, like myself, of conditioning uh, that, that comes in like a, uh, like a tiny aroma and then passes by. Um, it doesn't molest you at all, but there are question marks associated uh, with, you know, what, oh, gee, what is that? <clears throat> but it doesn't interfere with the unbroken joy. Um, there can be blips on the screen where there's a little bit of uh, a sorrow that uh, is very poignant, uh, but generally lasts a very uh, short moment uh, because you're completely aware of who you are. Um, what we're talking about here is the inability to communicate. And this is very common. Uh, as some of you may know, I have a partner uh, on the other side of the world in Australia. Um, Solve is her name. You've seen her gorgeous uh, imagery and uh, photographs uh, associated with the uh, Q&As. And, and if you watch my uh, follow my blogs, you see her pictures there frequently. And they are they are um, heart centered, energetically heart centered images, uh, certainly professional, uh, world class professional. But but far beyond that heart centered, they actually touch your heart when you when you allow yourself uh, to. Uh, let's say, see them in that way. And um, uh, this uh, beautiful being uh, who I, with whom I share a unicity, not a relationship because that's separation, but a oneness, um, also uh, often, and she'll say this often, um, has difficulty framing words. I have no problem understanding her at all because I'm listening from the heart. Uh, but she proclaims that she has trouble framing words. This is absolutely normal when one is experiencing their, call it their life experience. You are life, but you're experiencing life um, mostly um, out of the dream. The dream truly feels like a dream. Just like when you go into a movie um, and you're not, let's say, absorbed in the movie. You're just watching the movie. You're very much aware of the fact that you're sitting in a chair in a darkened theater and you're watching a movie and it's not you. Um, you're, you're aware that this isn't real. Well, when someone is, um, let's say, 99.99% um, living as the self, uh, then the dream uh, can, can feel totally like a dream. And the ability then to fall into what of necessity has to happen, to fall into the mind sufficiently to describe the dream in any way. Even if you're describing and you, and you can't describe truth, you can't put a frame around uh, uh, the, the infinite, um, but you can certainly describe what truth isn't. Uh, you can also describe the expression of truth, such as a sunset or a flower or or something uh, that's a beautiful experience and exchange between people. But even in that description, you are confining the truth that has no boundaries. So never are words sufficient to describe the truth. And so those that, that let's say, put it this way, come closer to who they really are or are living as who they really are most of the so-called clock time, but are still in a physical body for a reason, whatever it is. And right now, it's mostly to be a lighthouse for the rest of the of humanity that is uh, rapidly waking up on some level. By the way, I'm writing another handbook on that called Mass Awakening, which will hopefully be available in the next few weeks. Um, it's very common not to be able to place this frame around what you are experiencing because what you're experiencing is truth and truth can't be defined. So this is a common phenomena, a, a beautiful one, but it can be, uh, it can feel frustrating because let's say someone has asked you a question uh, and that question is you know, sincere, wants to know about truth in some way. And because you're experiencing truth, you're living as the truth you are, you would like to extend your self, capital letters, to the self that is that one who's asking you through the veil of conditioning called a person. Naturally, there's a feeling of, of uh, quote unquote, wanting is not the right word, but, but once again, we've got an issue with words. So we'll call it wanting 
to help lift that aspect of yourself, not another person. It's not a person you're lifting. You're lifting the veiled self that you are, what I call the slumbering God self that you are, uh, that is rapidly awaking by sharing with them the truth that you know, but of necessity, the communication usually occurs through words, written or spoken. So it's limited. Um, uh, the Master Ramana uh, has said that, you know, the greatest teaching is not teaching, it, but, but silence. And, um, and the truth can then be conveyed through silence. But this is not a subject that I'm going to get into here. Um, so uh, when you find yourself in a, and you will, if you continue on the pathless path to the home that you already are uh, at, in, as, uh, and have never left, uh, you will find moments, uh, perhaps many moments, where words fail you. And like myself, I used to be a communicator. That's what I did when I was an entrepreneur. Um, I was a, a person of words, but I'm no longer a person. I'm certainly not a person of words now, all evidence to the contrary. The words just come uh, when I'm involved in something like what I'm doing right now or writing, uh, because that's what this vehicle is being used for um, by the self. Um, but they're not my words, because there is no my, there's no me involved in them. Uh, it's like a comfortable channel has been dug and the self uses that communication instrument, just like if, let's say, you were a, a concert pianist or, or vocalist or, or artist, uh, the self can use those instruments to communicate through because they're comfortable channels. Uh, so uh, when you find yourself in those positions, it's a clear sign that you have, let's put it this way, dropped into the truth. Uh, and isn't that beautiful uh, to have that that um, proof um, uh, that uh, you are, in fact, living as who you really are? So um, thank you for that uh, beautiful it's a statement more than anything uh, that Elena has made. And uh, I, I very much appreciate that. I'm going to go to a question by Angela. I still struggle with going against what society conditioning expects from me or the feeling of hurting another when something is definitely no for me. I try to listen to my inner compass and ask, does this spark joy? But even if it's a no and I'm strong and choose to listen to the no, I'm still left feeling uncomfortable, guilty or bad in some way. I realize this is the false self at work due to conditioning. I recognize that I have a fear of consequences if I speak my truth or do what feels right for me. A lot of false self eyes and mys. Can you offer any light on this, please? Um, this is another excellent uh, question. Uh, and it is a phenomena that every single uh, being uh, will experience uh, when they are on the pathless path to freedom as their number one priority. Um, things come up hot and heavy, very fast, frequently, over and over and over again, because you have said yes to freedom. You've said yes to what is, and you've said yes, no matter what, I choose freedom. These are my words. You may choose to say the same thing in a different way. That's the way I uh, said it uh, when I jumped off the cliff in 1999. So. Um, whatever is ready to be dissolved, whatever conditioning is ready to be dissolved, is what will present itself. So, for example, when it's talking about guilt, talking about uh, fear of consequences, that, that's a kind of attachment um, to uh, an expectation uh, of results or fear of expectation of fear of what results may happen if I do this or that. Now, let me relate this to the enormous um, fire uh, that's going on in the planet right now. You have a, you, we have a situation where the collapsing patriarchy um, is uh, desperately uh, gasping its last breath as it departs um, in its, in its uh, tyrannical form. 
That is the divine masculine is dysfunctional. It's manifested as a patriarchy and it's collapsing has actually ended, but it takes a while for it to totally collapse as the divine feminine blends with it perfectly in balance and moves into an age of neutrality or an age of light or peace, which has been forecast by every uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, sacred text uh, that, that's in existence that has any credibility. Uh, this is happening as we speak. In the final days, so-called final days, which is what the book of Revelations in the Bible talks about uh, metaphorically, um, in those final days, you have a firestorm uh, as the collapsing entity, in this case, patriarchy, could have been a matriarchy, um, uh, tries to stay alive, basically. The energy of it tries to stay alive. And uh, it's finished, it's ended, uh, but there are still structures there and they're falling apart. So in doing so, in today's world, to be specific, um, you have a group, which some call the cabal, the elites, the Illuminati, um, uh, the deep state uh, is a common term used now, uh, that is a very, very powerful, has been a very powerful entity for um, about 250 years. And its plan was to have a one world government, which is basically a tyranny. Uh, that controls, eliminates most of the population and controls uh, the, the rest of the population. Um, this was its plan and still is its plan, despite the fact that it's already lost. Um, it's still gasping to do this. And one of the ways that it does it is by motivating enormous fear. And that fear was initiated through this, this uh, pandemic, which is not a pandemic. It's just simply a flu. And all the statistics have proven this, if anyone chooses to do their homework and not look at the media, uh, they will find ample proof. You know, it was downgraded to a, uh, a flu um, by the CDC, which is the so-called world authority um, and um, various uh, uh, remedies for it uh, have been around uh, since the beginning of it, which have been suppressed. Uh, any kind of information related to it not being serious is suppressed. All of these things are part of the communication network that it controls. Um, it also controls the pharmaceutical industry. It also controls the vaccine industry. And those that perpetrated uh, the, the, what some call the scamdemic or the plandemic, uh, they own the patents for this man-made virus. And they also are creating the vaccines, which will have embedded chips that then prevent you from doing anything if you don't uh, take them. Uh, this is the very, very short synopsis of many, many points uh, that are related to what is not real as their last ditch attempt to place fear on the entire planet, collapse the economy, and then they become the only alternative and they end up creating this one world government. This is what is playing out on the world stage right now. It's not real. Um, and there is no criticism. There's no judgment. There's no condemnation. This is God in disguise, in the guise of this thing that we can call the deep state, that believe their people, that believe they're real, that believe the world is real, and are in enormous fear, and have chosen to side with um, fear, and try to control that fear um, uh, by having a one world government. Um, this is not to be criticized. Uh, if you do, you give it power over you and it expands your own fear. This is to be observed from the audience as a free being, um, as part of the play that's playing out and will end very soon, uh, but not to buy into as something that you try to suppress or correct or fix or crush because you make it bigger with your attention. What you do, and this is difficult until you're free, is you embrace it in the love that you are because it too is love. It's just deeply sleeping. That's the real power. Trying to fix it is not. Okay, so my reason for explaining all of this to you, which I have before, but in somewhat more detail now, is to point to what this questioner has brought up uh, that has to do with fear of consequences. If you look at, in particular, 
the medical profession, if someone was to stand up and say, this is not real in the medical profession, just a couple of months ago, they would very often lose their job, if not their medical license. If they were to recommend some of these, um, we'll call them cures, for certainly you cannot cure conditioning. You can only uh, shift the energy around, as I said before. But let's say cure the symptoms of someone who's tested positive for this, this uh, flu. Um, and th this cure, uh, uh, which is called hydroxy, um, with a couple of other things, uh, has a 100% success ratio. No, no question about it working in the early stages at all. Um, and it's been around for 60 years and used for other things. It works for this 100% of the time when used in the early stages. If a doctor was to stand up and recommend this, they would very often lose their license. And the medical profession said this. So most of the medical profession falls into the category that this questioner is talking about. Enormous fear of consequences. They've spent how many years in school? There may be 28, 29, 30 before they, they finally get their their medical license and they, and they go to work and, and maybe they're 35 or 40. They haven't been doing it for long. It's their, their whole life focus and passion and love as they see it. And, and they're in actual danger of losing it within the dream if they stand up and say, uh, this works. This is, they may not say this, this is a flu, but they say this works. And so very, very few came forward. But of course, over time, over clock time, the frustration has grown. The facts and figures have come out that it's a 99.96% survival ratio with people, even if they don't have these, these so-called cures. Uh, so it's, it's nothing more than a flu. And, and these facts are, 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 are put out, uh, these figures are put out by the CDC, which is the world authority, so-called authority on, you know, the Center for Disease Control around the world. Uh, but they're suppressed by the media. So people don't know this. Very few people know this. But doctors know it. They've done their research. They've done their homework, most of them. And most of them are still afraid. They won't stand up and say anything. In fact, they may even defend uh, the lies that are being told about it. So this is the conditioning that is affecting those individuals, the fear of consequences. It's an enormous fear. There are, however, now thousands of doctors around the world many banded together and banded together with lawyers who are involved in uh, global class actions you probably haven't heard about this but it's it's happening that are taking a chance of losing their reputation losing their credibility losing their licenses standing up and verbally saying on video which is also suppressed very often taken down by facebook or twitter or instagram or youtube um it's being suppressed, but it is being said uh, by thousands of doctors that uh, this is not real. It's just a flu. The survival ratio is is higher than the seasonal flu. And here's the cure or cures. There's more than one now. Uh, so you see what's happened. Look at this macrocosmically and microcosmically that the fear that has been brought up is enormous. The chaos, the confusion that I've talked about before is enormous, but the real self, the slumbering God self is being shaken. And some have reached the line in the sand where they're willing to give up, not necessarily have to give up, but they're willing to give up anything and everything in capital letters, no matter what, to stand up for the truth. The truth as they see it may still be a mental thing, but this is a mirror for what is necessary when you reach the final stage of, of awakening um, and you've chosen freedom no matter what. So it's a microcosmic example of how the slumbering God self reaches a line in the sand and says, I will do this no matter what the consequences are, which is what the question was talking about. But this doesn't happen by you mentally saying you're going to make it happen, which is what I believe this question is about. You can't force it. You can't make it happen through thought. It happens when it's supposed to happen. It happens when a readiness, which means a sufficient amount of conditioning, has been transformed. And it definitely happens because everything is predestined 
until you've made this no matter what choice to be free, you're living a zigzag pattern based on predestination constructed and sculpted by the condition you came in with. Everything's predestined. So you can't make it happen. Uh, you reach that line in the sand when you reach it. But you will reach it and everyone will reach it. And when they do, they will make this choice that I'm willing, I'm willing, that's the key word, I'm willing to sacrifice, and there's no sacrifice, but you believe there is at that point. I'm, I'm willing to give up, to sacrifice. I'm willing to take the consequences, no matter what they are, for the sake of truth. Truth as you know it, but it's still the choice is towards truth. You see, the heart is involved in this. And this is what's going on globally right now. It's an enormous blessing and opportunity that's happening right now throughout the world through this terror for a lot of people. So hopefully you, you can see this because, uh, as I've said before, in the tale of two cities, it says it's the worst of times and it's the best of times. And it most definitely is the best of times. So uh, I've gone a little beyond what the question may have asked for, but it's so poignantly related to what's going on that I felt uh, it was worth investing a little more into. We've got some interesting questions coming in uh, in the chat. This one's from Soren who asks, can you speak about the word meaning? Does the self give things meaning or is it only of the mind? <laughs> okay, um, there is no meaning to anything because there isn't anything. Nothing that you experience, you meaning anyone, nothing that you experience in the world, in the universe, uh, if you want to get involved in dimensions and all of this talk about other realms and other planets and other beings and all this kind of stuff, it's still all within the dream. And the dream is an illusion. It's not real. None of it has any meaning whatsoever. None of it. So, yes, the mind suggests that there is meaning or meaninglessness, let's say, to this or that object to this or that circumstance. None of it's true. Uh, when you surrender totally to the truth, call it what you want. You can call it love. You can call it God. You can call it the one. I call it the self most of the time. Um, when you have surrendered completely to the truth, the concept of meaning dissolves. You could compare this to the idea of opinions. A person has an opinion about, which means they give a meaning to a particular subject, object, circumstance. Uh, they have a perspective about it. They have a take on it. That's the mind. Um, the object has no meaning at all. Uh, it's just an opportunity for the self to experience itself within the illusion that is projected on the screen of consciousness, which is also a name for itself. And in and of itself, none of these projections have any meaning. They're just an instrument, an environment created in an illusion, in a projection, for it to know itself, to, to savor and to taste itself and to know itself from A to Z, from 1 to 59 on the clock, which means the highest and the, and the lowest of experiences. So. Uh, nothing has meaning. Another question from the comments. This is from I Am Within. Would you please elaborate on embracing so-called darkness in love? Hmm. Anything that is so-called happening, nothing's really happening, but, you know, uh, that that can be a very blase and cold way of looking at the world, and it can make one uh, very indifferent. Um, and I, I don't use terminologies for belief systems, but this emanates from some belief systems that nothing is happening, so who cares? Well, no, that's that's not the way the self uh, responds to itself, buried within the dream of something happening. So when so-called darkness arises, when so-called light arises, call it love, if you wish, love in the mind, 
is always conditioned. So it's not real love. It can imitate love. It can have aspects of love, but there are always conditions veiling absolute true love until you are free. And that means you have no conditioning. Um, that's why all love is conditioned until you're free. Embracing everything is when you have said yes to what is. It doesn't matter what shows up. If you've said yes to what is, um, because it's happening, that doesn't mean that you agree with it. It means that you recognize that it is happening. It means that you're not resisting. It's another word for not resisting what is happening, so-called happening. It's not really happening, but so-called happening. And when that happens, there is an enormous lightness. I don't mean light in the sense, the sense of, of uh, shining light on something. I mean the, the, the weight on your shoulders, uh, metaphorically and, and tangibly on the body. The weight on your shoulders is lifted because you recognize uh, this is happening. There's nothing I can do about it. It is happening. I might be able to so-called do. There are many that feel they can do something about it not happening again or changing it or improving it or whatever. Um, but this is happening. So if there's darkness right now, if there is light or love right now, this is what's happening. So you embrace, you say yes to what is right this moment. And this is a, an always situation. You, you never not, you never do not embrace this or that. That's an opinion. That's a choice. That's a judgment. That's the mind saying, I accept this, but I don't accept that. And that's always where the problem is. Uh, those that are suffering still believe in, in victimhood, believe in separation, and they make choices. I like this, but I don't like that. You may not agree with this or agree with that, but it is happening. And if it's happening, you say yes to it. You don't resist it. And that way you're not attached to it. Whatever you do after that, if you choose to get involved, okay, you're still dreaming. You still believe you can fix a dream, which is not possible. But if that's where you are and it gives you joy, then that's where you're supposed to be for the moment. Or you may just remain in the state of focus on allowing the you, the real you, to emerge by removing or dissolving the veils, which is conditioning, the clouds hiding the sun. Uh, that's hiding the real you. That's where to place, that's the ideal place to place your attention. Uh, but certainly if you feel that you need to get involved in something, um, uh, be an activist involved, spiritual activist, and, and it gives you joy, then that's where you're supposed to be for the moment. Um, so hopefully that uh, answers the question. This question is from Jeanette, who wants to know, um, I don't recall you using the word ego. A friend is convinced it, the ego, has a purpose and a place. I feel it doesn't actually exist, but was formulated by the mind somewhere along the way. Could you explain? Yeah. Okay, I, I don't use the word ego because there's, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna exaggerate for a moment, there's a million descriptions for what um, uh, people believe the ego is. Probably thousands of books written on the subject and different definitions, many of them similar, some of them totally different. The ego is just another word for the false self, as I call it. And the false self is the body, mind, identity, which is sculpted from, which is designed, which is produced, which is manifested from the conditioning, expectations, attachments, identifications tied to uh, memory, which is the past, and imagination, which is the future. So your conditioning forms the false self. Another word for the false self is the mind. So the mind doesn't create it. The mind it manifests as a result of thought, and thought comes about as a result of the belief in separation. And the belief in separation is what manifests conditioning, because separation causes opposition. Opposition meaning there is a from here to there. There's a this, there's a that. Um, and as a result of that, there's always fear because there's a fear that there isn't enough to go around. And from that fear manifests all of the conditioning that I mentioned in all its many forms and thousands, millions of different ways and means the conditioning manifests. And that manifestation forms in 
a vehicle that the self can utilize, which is the body mind identity or false self. So the ego and the false self is one in the same thing, but without all the complicated explanations. It's formed from conditioning, which is formed from the belief in separation. And the idea of separation was the first idea that the self had in order to generate a from here to there scenario, the universe, so that it would have an environment to play, taste and savor itself in and know itself. Not a mistake. Uh, but ultimately, eventually, when um, it's had enough, it no longer needs this false identity, which is not real, it seems real, called the false self or the ego. It no longer needs it. And it then, the identity then dies. And it dies through the desolation of the conditioning. In other words, it just reverses its, tra its track, its tack, and dissolves the conditioning and the veils are removed and the self is revealed to be ever present as it always was, never went anywhere. That's what's really going on. So is the ego, is the false self, is the body mind identity necessary? Well, as long as the self is using a body mind identity to navigate within the dream, then um, it's necessary, it has a purpose. Um, when it's gone, when it dies, the body can remain, for example, in my case, it's died. Uh, the self remains, but it's using this body. And that's the case with anyone that is, is free, um, totally free. And, and so it can retain the body, uh, but it is not the body. It's using an illusion to navigate within um, the, the dream uh, for a purpose. Mostly when someone uh, arises uh, to that uh, level of awareness, they depart the body, you don't need to, to be here, uh, some, some state. So hopefully that uh, explains the similarity and the differences. This is a question from Anonymous. I still struggle with rejection and unfairness. The last two aspects of my experience that is stubbornly resisting acceptance and transcendence. I thought that I had dealt with this years ago. Apparently, we're doing a last dance. Please comment. Mm -hmm. Well, um, when one feels that they have, uh, uh, let's say, arrived and uh, they no longer have conditioning, they are definitely fooling themselves. Um, in most instances, uh, there are, at the very least, whispers. Um, and uh, it, it can be a tiny little thing uh, that comes up periodically, but it's, it's still something is there. Uh, you, meaning anyone, can be living as the self 99% of the clock time. Uh, but in all likelihood, unless all whispers are gone and you're self-realized and in all likelihood have departed the self, departed the body, I should say, um, uh, there, there are still perhaps not layers of conditioning, but there's definitely some conditioning, whatever it is. And it may remain dormant uh, until an appropriate moment uh, when it uh, arises and it can whack you in the side of the head. Because even though it's very slight, when you are very sensitive um, and aware and very cognizant, you turn over every stone. You don't let anything slip by at all. Uh, you don't allow yourself to be fooled, self, capital letters, to be fooled ever again. Uh, then you don't miss the tiniest of, of suggestions of what who you're not. Uh, so when you are ready for something, it will feel huge. It's really small, but it feels huge because of your sensitivity to the truth. Um, and so what? So it's there. So you just do the same thing. Ideally, I always recommend self-inquiry, surrender. Um, you know, who is it that's feeling this? Uh, me. Well, who am I? And I always add, I will be done, which is surrendered. Uh, that's all that's re uh, recommended as the ideal way. Ultimately, everyone ends up that way. There's no figuring out. There's no uh, beating yourself up. You can, but there's no reason to beat yourself up because it's not yourself. It's just a lingering conditioning that was ready to arise seemingly out of the pits of nowhere 
uh, and slap you in the face and say, oh, guess what? I'm still here. Okay. Who am I? Uh, me, you know, who is it that, that's just feeling this? Me. Who am I? Thy will be done. And, uh, and that aspect of that residual conditioning is transformed. It's as simple as that. Of course, it's too simple for the mind. Um, uh, so many don't accept this. But this is the pathless, very, very simple, not easy, but very, very simple, wayless way home. Histel has a, a question in the comments. Can you explain the monad, please? Uh, the simple answer is no. I don't get involved in esoteric discussion. I could most definitely explain it, but I'm not going to. Um, I don't get involved in uh, esoteric discussions, topics or suggestions that you know um, resonate from uh, ancient uh, uh, scripts, uh, Things that are in um, Sanskrit uh, and that sort of thing, you can you can look it up uh, in Wikipedia, and they'll give you a definition of it. But um, the purpose that that let's say in, in quotes I this body with the self in this body has is to um, share. And when I say share, I'm talking about pointing to, not explaining because you can't put a frame around infinity pointing to truth simply and clearly and anything which suggests complication um, it nearly always is coming from the false self who who wants to uh, learn about uh, subjects that will make it appear um, wise um, but sometimes it's it's genuine and in this case it may be very genuine you can, as I say, just look it up in Wikipedia. You'll see a, um, an explanation for it uh, or anywhere. There's lots of explanations for the monad and many other terms associated with that. I don't get involved in anything that's going to confuse people. Now, I, I'd like to take this opportunity also to just talk about my blog. When I um, uh, post on my blog, I'm posting simplicity and clarity pointing towards truth. If someone then makes a comment, which would be, heartfelt, well-meaning, um, that wants to elaborate uh, and or add a lot of esoteric discussions, which is absolutely fine elsewhere. It's not okay uh, as comments under my blog because it can confuse those that are looking at clarity and then all of a sudden get confused because here's a deeper, more complicated uh, explanation with lots of words that I don't understand. None of that leads you to truth. Ultimately, you have to unlearn everything. As Ramana said, all knowledge is learned ignorance. It all has to be let go of. And hopefully what I share, what I post, which is not I, not, not John McIntosh, but the self through this instrument, posts is dead, simple, and clear. And that's the way it remains. So uh, thank you very much for the question. As I say, go to Wikipedia, you'll get an explanation, but I won't get involved in discussions uh, such as that. There's a question from Anonymous. At times we can inadvertently hurt someone. What do you say about offending someone or being offended? Okay. You can take me away, by the way, John. Okay, I'm not sure what that means, but <laughs> there you go. Um, the self cannot be offended. Why? Because nothing sticks to it. There's no condition, there's no expectations, there's no uh, uh, attachments, and there's no um, identifications. So nothing sticks to it. So no matter what mud you sling at the self, you can't touch it. And the self speaking to a so-called person is not speaking to a person, the body, mind, identity, or false self. It's speaking to the slumbering God self that's veiled by the false self, by the conditioning. And so if it's speaking to itself, it cannot offend. So it can't be offended and it cannot offend. Simple as that. I'm going to sneak this in. Um, in the comments, Arvind wants to know how to get to self-realization. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, the only thing that I talk about, and, and as I said before, the only thing that I point to is this one question. That's the only thing. And I say it over and over and over and over again, uh, hopefully in different ways, but I'm, I'm the epitome of redundancy because I say the same thing over and over and over until some will, will say, oh, I got it. And um, I, I use a reference sometimes to, um, I used to teach a course in miracles and, uh, and uh, there was a passage in it uh, that I got to um, uh, and read uh, quite a number of times because I was taught it for 10 years. And it said, uh, give up this course, give up everything and fall empty handed into the arms of your loving mother, father, God, paraphrasing. And that all of a sudden hit me between the eyes. I don't need this. Give up this course meant, and this book is thick. It's, it's very, very long, bigger than a Bible and very tissue paper, you know, the kind of paper in a Bible. It's very, very thin paper. It's a very, very long uh, dissertation in three parts. And I had studied all of it. In fact, I recorded the entire book, put it online uh, years and years ago, 15, 20 years ago, whatever it was, um, and, uh, and taught it. I had everything underlined and highlighted. I was very much into it for a while. And then I read that line for maybe the 10th, 20th, 30th time, I don't know. And I got it. And when I got it, I realized I don't need to learn anything. I need to unlearn everything. That's what it was saying. You don't need any outside learning from any source whatsoever. You go direct within, fall into the loving arms of your mother, father, God. So that's what I did. And I've not read a book since. Um, I may have read Harry Potter. I like Harry Potter, but I, but I never read anything since. Um, and uh, I read snippets, of course, uh, because I, it's joyful to do so. So um, when it comes to self-realization, I just say it over and over again, when conditioning is dissolved, attachments, expectations, identifications tied to memory and imagination, when that's dissolved, you're free, you're self-realized, totally. That's how you do it. And the best way to do that is through self-inquiry, surrender, all modalities, all disciplines. I don't care how ancient, how beautiful they may be, every tradition, every religion, every single one of them eventually ends up at self-inquiry, surrender. That's where you end up. That's the direct route to self-realization or to truth or to, as I call it, freedom. I think we're at the end of our time together. So I want to invite everyone who's on the broadcast to join us next week at the same time uh, in the same place. And um, we'll probably be here. <laughs> probably uh, anything can happen, but uh, for the for the time being, for the moment, uh, we'll be here. <laughs> so thank you uh, so much again for being with us. And uh, it's a joy uh, to, to share the truth with uh, uh, so-called others who are just basically are us. Thank you. Lots of love. Bye for now. Bye-bye.